Yermak, Yermak. finishing touches, finishing to, the touches to the portraits. Impassioned by glory in a severe and sullen country, on the wild Irtish riverside, Yermak was sitting deep in thought. A famous song about an unknown hero with an unrevealed biography, Yermak was the conqueror of Siberia. This is a wild waterside of Irtish not far from Pavlodar and the Yamashevsky Lake. According to the generally accepted version, Yermak died on the Vagaya River, Irtish's tributary in the vicinity of Tabolsk. He was injured and drowned under the hefty weight of a male armor, which was an imperial present. However, there is a less common version according to which the gentleman of the road met his demise at the Yamish Lake, where he'd been lured by Kuchum Khan. But myths are created exactly for the purpose of believing them and passing them from mouth to mouth onto descendants, embellishing certain things and omitting the forgettable. Chapter 1. A Man of Mystery there is an absolutely liberal reconstruction of famous Yermak's appearance. What he looked like is unknown. Wild guesses and assumptions are all around us. Some say his name is Vasily Timofeyevich Alenin, but this fact is disputable too. His biography is completely contestable. It's been five centuries since generations have been trying to guess who he was and why he went to Siberia. But first and foremost, the greatest puzzle is his personality. Halenin is a presumable name which had been mentioned only a century later. According to historian Nikolai Karamzin, Yermak was of unknown provenance but with a great soul. Hence the abundance of speculations. Various versions presumably suggest that he was born in Arhangelsk on the Kama or the Don Riverside. Some even suggest that he came into the world in Suzdal. Back then, Karamzin made it clear that his ethnicity was fairly contentious. All the versions out there have a right to exist. All the more so because he had an unusual nickname Yermak, which is extremely rarely mentioned in Russian chronicles. This is precisely why the dispersion of assumptions is so incredible, with some saying that this is a garbled version of names Yermalai, Yermil, the German Hermann, or Ermanarik. Some even suggested that Yermak was an Italian of Jewish descent and that he embarked on the quest for romantic endeavors on the road. He allegedly came either from Geno or some other place. The more realistic version is that he was an Ural Cossack plundering the Ural steppe. In such a way, this serves as a foundation for another and fairly popular assumption that Yermak might be of Turkic origin. Yermak, Yermak is translated from the Turkic language as Jarmak, which means a manual millstone or to be more precise a stone because it comes from the word jaru which is translated as the verb to break the details of Yermak's appearance are verifiably known from the data preserved from Simeon Remizov he said that Yermak had been a very heavy set and tall person he was well built but dark skinned and had a flat face but these were just conjectures. Yermak was a person who had committed a crime and avoided punishment by escaping from his native places, or a man who had changed his faith and became a paria, a Cossack. As a native of Turkic nations, some say, he had been a traitor by letting the Russian forces advance to Siberia. The most credible sources are considered to be Remizov and Yesipov chronicles written by Simeon Remizov and Sava Yesipov around a century after the events. The chronicles were made based on popular word of mouth from people who presumably saw Yermak when he was very young, as well as based on folk songs and legends. As is wont, this is biased data. So what veracity can we be talking about? Chapter 2, Siberia at War After a warm summer, chilly winter sets in, dear brothers. So where shall we go, dear brothers, to overwinter? We should live on Volga riverside and be reputed as thieves, while going to the Ural means a great passage, and in Kazan a formidable Tsar waits. According to the song, this is how Yermak thought his bitter thoughts and took his band of men to Irtish to conquer Siberia. 
Some sources say that the chieftain made the song-like speech at the Ural River, somewhere in the vicinity of the present village of Chagan in the Atarao region. I think that he was one of gentlemen of fortune in our history, who is being undeservedly glorified. According to chronicles, the Yermak band committed robberies and in 1580 they attacked and destroyed Saraychuk, the capital city of the Nogai Horde. The Nogai people then wrote a letter of complaint to Ivan the Terrible that your Cossacks came to the Ural River, robbed the city of Saraychuk and above all opened up graves and took out the bones. It was the worst sacrilege imaginable. This is why they asked the Tsar to take appropriate measures in relation to his Cossacks. The Tsar said that they were not his subjects and said that should they be detained, one could be free to hang them and do as they please. Trying to escape the just retaliation, some people succumbed to Yermak's eloquence and followed him. This is the shield of vigilante Yermak. It is said to have been reconstructed in the image and likeness. This is how it is put on. There is a special fur lining made specifically for cold Siberian weather so that the arm doesn't freeze over to the iron shield. The helmet on the head is called Shishak. The chain armor weighs more or less 16 kilograms. A little axe or a sword in the arm. It is unclear how many such men there were in Yermak's band. Various sources say different numbers with a great variance in digits from 5,000 to 500. The second version seems more realistic to historians. Putting together a few thousands of Cossacks and form a small army looks like an unlikely thing, especially so because the population size was sparse. The band swam in boats, each of which could seat 40 people maximum, and off they went in search of money and fame. Today we aren't able to point to definite places where Yermak and his troops went through, but the matter of fact is that the territory of northern Kazakhstan was part of Siberian Khanid, and it is very likely that Yermak's troops went along northern Kazakhstan. Kuchum Khan led the Siberian Khanid, but his ancestral home was the Kazakh horde, historian Khadi Atlasi says. But the majority of scientists believe that he was a Shaibanid from the dynasty of Uzbek Khans. But everyone agrees that Kuchum gained power by killing the rest of the candidates. Kuchum Khan was a Chinggisid, the descendant of Genghis Khan. At the same time, he was related to Kazakh Khans. Murtaza's son Kuchum from the Kazakh horde with many of his warriors approached a Siberian city and after capturing it he killed Yatkar and Begbulat and became the Tsar of all Siberian land. He subjugated a lot of peoples. Kuchum spent many years reigning in Siberia peacefully and freely and collected tributes paid off in furs. This is how life was before Yermak's arrival. After conquering Isker or Kishlak, the capital city of Kuchum's Khanid, Yermak, the Cossack chieftain, started collecting tributes, and Kuchum fled. This is an approximate description of events which had taken place around half a thousand years ago in October 1582. The fight went on for three days, and the Kazakhs had an advantage in terms of the number of weapons, muskets, hagbats. They were also way more disciplined and organized. Some Cossacks went on ashore and started seizing the city, whereas the rest remained on the boats and kept on firing. Such was their mutually assisting action. Kuchum's army used predominantly bows and arrows. Surely any gun will be much more powerful in any situation compared with bows and arrows. The widely accepted version was that Yermak, accompanied by Stroganov merchants, went to conquer Siberia for Ivan the Terrible. Among the possible versions is that Yermak possibly robbed Stroganovs and went to Isker on his own. After defeating Kuchum, he sent the Tsar expensive presents to deserve apologies for the past robbery. Another hypothesis is that Yermak went to Siberia to return what rightfully belonged to him. 
Allegedly, he was a Turkic prince, a son or nephew of Bekbulat, who'd been killed by Kuchum and had more rights to claim the rights for Siberian throne. Yermak, uh, Yermak went to uh, Siberia to conquer Kuchum Khan because he wanted to take back the land and assert himself in Siberia. Researchers say that this hypothesis is backed up by the fact that Yermak with a small squadron managed to subjugate a fairly large part of Siberian Khanate. This could be done by a person who knew Siberia very well, because these were his native areas. Incursions were Yermak's usual tactics. He would attack, burn the cities and flee with the plunder. However, the campaign in the Siberian kingdom required an absolutely different strategy. Disregarding the many losses, Yermak moves purposefully to the capital city of Kuchum. For a stranger with a small troop, this meant a certain death. If the Cossacks had decided to make a routine inroad to feast on strangers' possessions, then why would they want to go such a distance and do it at such a price? It felt as if the troop went to take revenge. There might have been a blood feud between Yermak and Kuchum. After he defeated Kuchum, Yermak doesn't go away. He continues living in Isker, sails along the Siberian rivers, collects tributes, administers an oath to the locals as a full-fledged master of the new land. There isn't a mention there saying that he was authorized to do so by Ivan the Terrible. While after high-ranking messengers came in from Ivan the Terrible and brought forgiveness and royal presents to Yermak, among them there allegedly was a double-chain armor. Chapter 3, The Last Campaign But the fatal lot was close by and was looking at the victim with a curious gaze. It is considered that the fatal lot overtook the Cossack chieftain on the Vagai River. In August 1584, as he lost numerous warriors in the battles and due to famine, Yermak and around a hundred of his men-at-arms embarked on a regular and the last campaign to plunder a caravan from Central Asia. He needed food and money. The band put up a tent. According to the chronicles, there was pouring rain. Kuchum attacked unexpectedly and the chieftain was stood on the defensive but was injured and drowned under the weight of the royal present. Certain sources say that Kuchum regretted Yermak's death. But how could an arch enemy regret the death of his foe? This is another historic puzzle. However, this is a legend which was assumed and written out in the course of several decades, just like the others, as well-known story about the Yamish Lake near the Kazakh town of Aksu. This is another presumed place of the chieftain's death. According to the legend, Yermak's body was found two weeks later and was identified by his armor. This was done to emphasize that the enemy was killed. His body was lifted to scaffold and arrows were fired at him in a symbolic execution of Yermak. Kuchum, as the legend goes, also fired at the late Yermak. The nomads organized a feast to mark Yermak's death, slaughtered 30 oxen and 10 sheep, held horse races and fights. He is said to have been buried near a Muslim cemetery, but only near the cemetery. This makes you think what his faith was. Numerous expeditions were organized, but Yermak's tombstone hasn't been found in Vagai. Perhaps the search was carried out in the wrong place. The gale was roaring, the rain was beating down, the lightning was shining in the dark, and thunder would crash incessantly, while the winds raged in the wilds. 